Amen. Please open your Bibles to James chapter 4. We're in James chapter 4 and verse 13. As we read Scripture, we're challenged to live out God's Word in our daily lives. And our theme throughout the book of James has been faith in action, implying that we can't keep our faith separate from how we live our life. And it's not where we have what we claim to be our religion that we have wrapped nice and tight to be enjoyed when we feel like it on maybe a couple hours Sunday morning or Saturday evening or whenever someone may choose to to worship. But sometimes people get defensive when they they feel like something is interfering with what they want to do with their life. And so somebody might say, well, yeah, that's my religion, but, you know, that doesn't affect what I do here. Or that's what I choose to believe, but it doesn't have any bearing on my daily life or my work or my career or the choices I make. And we can't read James, we can't read any of Scripture without realizing that that's not true. Somebody could claim that, but in that sense it would be their religion wouldn't be valuable. As the Bible says many times, that person's religion would be useless. It wouldn't be of really any value except maybe to give them something to claim, well, this is my religion. Because as we think about faith and our relationship with God, that's either real or it isn't. It either exists or it does not exist. And so if we have a personal relationship with God, if we recognize that not only that He died on the cross, and was buried and rose again the third day, but but I recognize He did that for me because I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. And I don't just believe it happened, but I commit my life to following Him as a believer, as a Christ follower. That's why I call Him Lord. Jesus is the Lord of my life. He's the boss of my life. So that means that that relationship then has to affect other aspects of my life. And so sometimes when we talk about this, we might think, well, you know, the the teenagers really need to pay attention to this because they're getting ready to, they're already making decisions that are going to impact the rest of their life. Or college students or young adults need to hear this because they're making decisions now that impact the rest of their lives. When our Sunday school lesson today, we were told that God had a conversation about this with Abraham when he was 99. So there's nobody in here that I know of that's 99 yet. So what that should remind us is that no matter where we're at in life, God has plans for us. And He has things that we need to be seeking Him. God, what do do I need to do today? What do I need to do this year? What are you doing with my life? Because sometimes we look back and we think of critical moments of decision where we had a choice to make that was very clear Do I go this way or do I go that way? And we may look at those as adults looking back and say, you know, that was a critical decision in my life, what I was going to do. But we may need to be reminded those times of decision are not over. They're not all in our past. They're going to continue. And it doesn't matter how old we get, God is still wanting to speak to us about what to do with our lives. So I hope that we will all kind of evaluate and think about those things today as we look at James chapter 4, starting in verse 13 and reading through verse 17. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Your notes are in your the back of your bulletin there. The first point we get from this passage is that it is boastful for us to make future plans 
as if we are in control of the future. Think about that. A lot of the plans that we talk about, it's as if they're certain, even though they, things haven't happened yet. He's talking in verse 13 specifically about financial plans, businessmen that talked about going to a place, a city, and spending time there and making money. And so that's kind of the overall context, is that James is really calling out uh, people within the church that were very active in business, and they talked about how, well, we'll do this, and we're going to go there, and we're going to stay one year, and our business is going to be successful, and we're going to make this amount of money, and, and then we're going to move on somewhere else. And he's kind of calling them out, saying, you don't, you don't know that. You don't know what's even going to happen tomorrow. And I wonder if you can remember some events that have transpired in your life that caught you by surprise. In my announcements today, I talked about how the children's event that we planned for last Sunday at 5, well, we planned that long early, and we had some really bad weather last Sunday, and we couldn't anticipate that. So we moved it to tonight, and tonight it looks like we're going to have bad weather. Well, that's something that somebody's going to say, well, that's just a little thing. Well, what are some big things that happened in your life that you would say just completely caught you by surprise? Some of you probably were very much affected by Hurricane Katrina. Some of you were probably very much affected by Hurricane Isaac. Some of you by both. Some people have had a job loss, a health problem, a tragedy in the family, maybe a divorce or just some broken relationship or an unexpected expense, maybe with your car or your house or something like that. Maybe a car accident that changed your life uh, health-wise or financially or whatever it might be. We cannot predict any of these things. We don't know what's going to happen today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year. But God does. He is in control and He knows the future. So because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year or five years from now, does that mean that I should just live irresponsibly and live like there's no tomorrow and, and not make responsible plans for the future? No, that's not what God is saying. Uh, when we read the whole Bible and we read about being good stewards and, and being responsible believers, He does want us to plan. For example, if you own a vehicle or you have the responsibility to care for a home, even though it's true that you don't know what's going to break over the next year, you do know something's going to break. And so to not plan for it and then act like you just had no idea that a car could break down, people are going to go, well, didn't you know that a car could break? I mean, you didn't know what was going to break. but And so we know just from common sense that we should plan. But I should seek godly wisdom, as James mentioned. He talked about it in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. He talked about it in chapter 3, verses 13 and 18. So use godly wisdom to guide my life, but recognize that I don't know all the details that God does and that God is the one that ultimately is in control. Mutual funds and investments even do this. They even name funds kind of giving you the concept that they're predicting the future. I was born in 1970, so I'll be 65 if I'm still alive in the year 2035. And so they have these retirement funds that are named after the approximate time frame that you would be at the typical retirement age of 65. So there's a My Destination 2035 fund for people like myself. They're telling you, boy, that's a long time in the future to be predicting the stock market when we really don't know what's going to happen on Monday, right? So they're saying, you know, if you're born in 1970 or between 1965 and 1975, you might want to pick this My Destination 2035 fund and just leave the rest up to us. And when, when 2035 rolls around, we've got you covered. Well, there's, of course, no guarantee, right? 
They have no idea. But they're saying our, our investment habits are going to be based on that. But they have no clue. No clue whatsoever. So James is kind of calling us out on that, of saying, hey, you're making plans as if it were up to you. But God's reminding us it's not up to us. So yes, make wise decisions. Yes, live responsibly. But don't be surprised when your plans don't pan out the way you want them to. So there's that. And then the other part of that is that it is arrogant for us to make future plans as if God did not exist. So the first part focused on who's in control. Am I in control of the future or is God? But the second point is different. It comes about what are my plans for the future, not just who's in control of it, but what does God have to do with my life? He says in verse 14, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He reminds us that our life is short. Way back uh, last week in verse 11, we see where James chastised his congregation for putting themselves in the position of God when they spoke evil about another believer. He said, you know, the law tells you not to do that, and you know what the law says, so if you speak evil of one another anyway, he told us last week, you're putting yourself in the position of God who wrote the law, who is the judge, so you're actually judging God, therefore putting yourself in a position of being judged by Him. So now, similarly in this passage, he's kind of reminding us um, you might not want to presume on the future by not relying on God, by just forgetting about God and saying, I'm just going to do whatever I want. So not only should we not make plans as if God did not exist, but we should be seeking His will for our future plans. I want you to think about something. If you're a believer, you have placed your faith in Jesus alone for your salvation. If you're a believer, you believe that at the end of life, the eternal decision has already been made on am I going to suffer in burning hellfire forever and ever and ever with no kind of relief? Or am I going to live in the presence of Jesus Christ in heaven with other believers for all of eternity? Those are the only two options, eternally. So how ridiculous is it then if I trust Jesus with that, my eternity, where a billion years from now, there'll still be no end in sight because eternity never ends. It gives me a headache when I really stop and think about eternity. Calculus was difficult for me. Those infinity signs and thinking about infinity. So why in this little gap of time that I'm on earth, why would I not seek that same God's plan for me, knowing that He has my eternity planned? Knowing that I've trusted Him with my very life. Why would I not say, God, what do you want me to do? Why would we not ask Him things like that? God, do you care where I work? God, do you care who my friends are? God, do you care who I date? You know you eventually marry who you date. So why would you date somebody who's not what you might call marriage material? Why would you even do it? And I say, well, I'm not thinking about getting married. I'm just. You ask everyone that's married, did you eventually, did you ever go out on a date with that person you're married to? Ever? And I say, well, yeah. Well, they may not have thought on that first date they'd be married. It is true that you marry who you date. 
God cares about that stuff. He cares who your friends are. If your friends are always doing evil things, and you're always that one going, oh, I wasn't doing anything. There were just these people. with God cares about that stuff. He cares about your education. If you're in school or think that you're going to go to school, it's a good thing to pray about. God, what do you want me to do? Do you care what I do with my life? Do you care what path I take in my education plans? God, do you care where I work? God, what about how I spend my time, my hobbies, the things that I like to do? He cares about all that stuff. And sometimes I think we try to keep him out of that because we say, well, that's my personal business. Like, yeah, but you're a Christian. Jesus is Lord. You've trusted him with keeping you in heaven instead of hell. That's like the biggest thing ever. He's the one that forgave me of my sin. Shouldn't I listen to him about who my friend should be? Who my wife should be? What I'm going to do with my time where I'm going to spend my life serving him? That just seems to make sense. In Jeremiah 29.11 he said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Even though we typically think about the future and the hope part of that verse, I'm always taken back by the first part. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. God, the God of the universe, is thinking about you. That's amazing. God thinks about me. God thinks about you. Not just you in general, like people. He's talking about you by name. He thinks about you. He has a plan for you. He already has mapped out His will for your future. And this is just something we need to get in our heads, I think. Anytime we sin, we are not following God's will. Would you agree with that? That God never wants us to sin. So, what we need to stop doing is misrepresenting God by saying things like, well, I guess that was just God's will for that terrible thing to happen. I guess it was just in His plan. We go against God's will all the time. Every time we sin. So don't just make decisions based on what you want. They work out terrible. And then blame God for it by saying, well, God, I guess that was just the way you wanted it. No! He has a plan for us. But He doesn't make us do that plan. Now, overall, does God in His sovereignty and His providence, are things in this world going to come about to their appropriate end? Absolutely. But as far as your willingness to be a part of God's plan, your decisions make all the difference. God, am I going to be in your will or not? God, I know you're going to ultimately accomplish what you want to do. But God, I would be blessed to be a part of it. And if I'm seeking God's will, and I'm willing to do what He wants me to do, and go where He wants me to go, I get that privilege of saying, wow, God, I got to see you do amazing things. Versus just doing whatever I want, and then asking God to bless it. So, sometimes we just rush in. We have desires. Sometimes, if we're honest, those desires are selfish and not pure. And we just go after what we want. He talked to us about that in the first part of chapter 4. About our desire for pleasures. That's what the first part of chapter 4 was about that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. So, a lot of times we just do that. We go after what we want. And then we say, God, why did this turn out so terribly? I always make a decision and say, God, will you please bless what I've decided to do without you? God's plan is for us to seek Him first, wait for direction, and then obediently follow. But boy, that takes patience. It takes time. It takes putting our desires aside 
and saying, God, I have desires, but I know those are selfish. I know that I can't always get what I want, and that if I did get what I wanted, that wouldn't always be a good thing. So we can't do what we want and then blame the results on God. In Jeremiah 33.3, he says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Think about that. Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's why we can't just use human logic to make all of our decisions. Because he says, you don't even know. You don't even know what your options are. Call to me and I will answer you and I will show you options that you didn't even know were on the table. That He does. And who else would we want to trust with that than somebody that loves us, somebody that gave His all for us, and somebody that has it all planned out. He closes it with verse 17. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. In this context of these businessmen that he's calling out, he was saying, you know better. So for you to do that, it's sin. For you to not seek God's plan for your future, even your future business, for you to not seek out what God's will is, he's telling them they know better that it's sinful. But that third point that I think is kind of a sobering thought is that we can sin by doing nothing. Why do I say it's a sobering thought? Because I'm already overwhelmed with the sins I do know about. It's like the things that you do, we usually think of as being our sins. But he's saying that if you know to do good and you don't do it, that's sin. So we often uh, would refer to these as sins of omission versus sins of commission. If you commit something, if you commit a crime, something you did. If you get a test back and you miss points because you omitted information, you're getting marked off for information you left out, for information that you did not supply. Maybe you did not answer a question. It was omitted. It was you got marked wrong. So when we hear somebody pray, Dear Lord, please forgive us for sins of omission and commission. That's where that comes from. It's saying that if I know what's right and I do nothing, I am sinning. That's why we have to guard against uh, legalism and hypocrisy by bragging about what we don't do. Going through the commandments. Well, I don't do that, so I'm good. I've never done that, so I'm good. And that can just puff up a person to say, wow, you're just a model citizen, so so you're perfect. Well, we know better. And verses like this remind us about that. What about all the times we should have done something that God wanted us to do, said something God wanted us to say, and instead we did nothing, we said nothing, Because we were awkward, we were uncomfortable, we were disobedient, and God is telling us that too is a sin. So we reap the consequences when we refuse to get involved. And I would equate that too. I've talked about this monastic lifestyle where somebody, you know, recluses into a cave with their books and just wants to spend time with God and sometimes people spiritualize that and make it sound like they're really following God but what they're actually doing is removing themselves from other people making it to where they don't ever have to have a conversation with another human being we've talked a lot in James about the words that come out of our mouths and how damaging the tongue can be how it's just a little part of the body but how it just you know there's so much of our sin wrapped up in what we've said. 
And so some people would say, well, you know what, if I just got away from people and I didn't have to say anything, think about how much less I would sin. So I'm just going to take my books and go live in a cave and shut myself off from society and I'll be one of those monks. Well, we know that's not God's will. He put us here to be salt and light. He put us here not to choose to get away from people and just get with Him. The whole book of 1 John is about that relationship with other people and how we can't separate it from our relationship with God. He tells us, you know, don't claim that you love me, but you hate your brother. So don't try to, don't try to compartmentalize the two. Just like in this, don't try to compartmentalize my, my faith or my religion from my life. I can't do that. It's impossible. And so if I love God, that means i got to love my brother. And if I don't, there's a problem. There's a problem with both. And so I've got to be around people. I have to be having conversations with people and still be held to God's accountability of what comes out of my mouth, what I say, but also what I, what I don't say that I should have said. Some of you might be able to remember a time, maybe in school, but you know, bullies don't all quit being bullies when they get out of high school. And um, so you might might recall a time where you saw somebody being being bullied, and you just watched it happen. It didn't do anything. You knew it was wrong. You wanted to say something, but you didn't know what to say, and you just let it happen. Those are the kind of things he's talking about. Salt and light. We can't be salt and light if we've always got our mouth closed and we're unwilling to get involved. A lot of times, that's why people won't get involved because they know it's messy and they just can't handle the conflict. But when we remove ourselves from usefulness, we can't be surprised when evil runs amok. There's a famous quote I believe properly attributed to Edmund Burke. I've heard it attributed to so many people over the years, but looking into it, I think it belongs to Edmund Burke, uh, 18th century Irish philosopher and conservative, who said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. One of the hugest examples of that that we can think of is what happened with Adolf Hitler in World War II. All the people in Germany that had to do nothing and say nothing for that man to be able to cause the damage that he did. But you can think of other things. I can think of many things in my life where I would say that would be true. Where people just weren't willing to do anything. We know right from wrong by reading the Word of God. That's why He tells us to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. He said, you know better because I've shared it with you in the Word of God. So now it's up to us to put our faith in action. Are we just going to talk about it? Are we just going to learn about it? Or are we going to do it? So let us seek God in all that we do. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray through Your Word that we've been compelled, Lord, to trust in You not to compartmentalize our lives, not to try to keep you out of certain parts of our lives that we don't want you in. God, I pray we'd invite you to take over. We call you Lord. I pray that we would mean it, that you'd be the boss. Lord, for those that have decisions to make on their future, on their career, on their schooling, education, or training, or where they work at, God, I pray if they've never done it before or haven't done it in a while, that they would do it now to say, God, what do you want me to do? So much when we talk about your plans, we think the pastor is talking about going on the mission field in some international country or being a pastor or something like that. But God, that's, that's not the case. That's a specific calling. But Lord, wherever our employment has us, whatever our background is, wherever we function in life, God, we want to be in Your will. And there are people that we will meet at our work that don't go to church, that don't have any other influence, 
And that may be exactly why you have us where we're at. Lord, I pray that we would take that seriously, that we would just invite you into our relationships to pray, God, am I, am I hanging around the right people? Am I spending my time with the right people? Am I spending my free time doing what you want me to do? Is the relationship that I'm in your will? And Lord, I pray you'd give us uh, discernment and affirmation and just a very clear direction. God, that we'd seek you first, wait for your answer, and then act instead of doing what we want and then asking you to bless it. Lord, there may be somebody here that knows the truth of the story about you and how you were born and, and lived a sinless life and died on the cross and were buried and rose again. But God, maybe they haven't acted on it. Maybe they've just intellectually acknowledged the truth of the Bible without committing to you personally as Lord, as boss. And Lord, maybe you'd want them, uh, we know you would want them to do that today. But God, they have a decision to make. Are they going to follow? Is their faith going to be real in every single thing that they do? Lord, we would pray right now that you bless this time that people would be obedient to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.